programs are rarely finished. We release versions and we share our programs with other people, but there's always some other features we want to add, some other extensions that we want to contribute, or some aspects of a program that we're hoping to improve later. So now we're going to talk about a topic briefly called information hiding, which is generally used to hide from other users the parts of a program that might frequently change. So that if they are using your program in some way, they aren't surprised by all the changes you're making. So one way to hide information from users is to designate some attributes as being for internal use only, meaning used by the class in its implementation, but not a set of attributes that are expected to be used directly by the user. So an attribute name that starts with one underscore is not meant to be referenced externally. Let's look at an example using iterators, which we covered last time. So here's a Fibonacci iterator. It's a class that stores the next Fibonacci number and then whatever is going to be added to that next Fibonacci number in order to get the one after that. So we'll call those the next and add end. Every time next is invoked, the result is stored temporarily so that it can be returned. The result is just the next thing that's going to be returned. But then we have to update self.addend and self.next so that when next is invoked another time, we get the next Fibonacci number after that. And you see the familiar recurrence that we bind next to addend and the sum of these two to next. So how do we use Fibiter? Well, we create one Fibonacci iterator, we'll call fibs in this case, and then every time we call next on it, we'll get the next Fibonacci number. So in this expression, which is a list comprehension with no name given to the value of each element in range, we're just calling next on fibs a bunch of times and collecting the results, and we see the Fibonacci sequence, or the first 10 elements of it. Okay, so the important new thing about this example is that we see that some attributes are annotated with underscores, which is an indication to other users of your program. Please don't reference these directly. They may change. If you want to rely on FibIter to be something that computes Fibonacci numbers, use it just by calling next. Use it as an iterator. So this naming convention is not enforced. Someone could go in and look at or even change the underscore add end name. But this is typically respected. And the reason is we want to make sure that a programmer who's designing some public module that other people use in their programs can change internal use names so no one should rely on them. But usually when people are developing a public module, they try not to change other aspects such as class names or method names or function names. It is the case that if you really want to hide something even more than this in a way that's enforced by the Python interpreter, you could start a name with two underscores. And that actually makes it so that looking up the attribute name on an object just won't work unless you're within the body of the class that defined that attribute. That's used actually more rarely than just the single underscore convention. Another way of hiding information is to use local names, which we've done since the beginning of the course. So a name bound in a local frame is not accessible to other environments, except those that extend the frame. So you can make them accessible using higher order functions. But for the most part, if you define a local name, then it's just local to the function that you're defining it in and nobody else can access it. So if we want to create a similar iterator over Fibonacci numbers using a generator function, we can have local names there, and the information there is hidden regardless of what names we use. So here's a version where we yield zero, and then we keep track of the previous and the current values of the Fibonacci sequence, and then forever we yield the current value and rebind previous and current. So this fib generator function returns a generator, which is a type of iterator, so fibs is some object that we can call next on, but there's no way when you have fibs 
to access the internal names. Those, that piece of information is hidden from anyone who wants to use Fib Generator to iterate over the Fibonacci numbers. Here's one more idea for hiding information is to rebind names. So a singleton class is a class that only ever has one instance. So in the built-in set of classes and values, an example of this is the none type, which is the type of the none object, and it's a singleton class. None is its only instance. So there's one none, there's also one none type, and none type has one instance, which is none. And this relationship where you have only one of something is what I mean when I say that an object is a singleton. I mean, its class only has one instance. For user-defined singletons, some programmers use the following trick in order to rebind the class name to the instance. So they'll say something like, I want to define an empty iterator, and I want there to be only one empty iterator. So I'll do it by defining a special class for the empty iterator and give it some behavior. So in this case, every time you invoke next on the empty iterator, it says we're out of values. So this is an iterator that has no values. The way in which we help ensure that there's only one empty iterator is that we call the class to make an instance, but then we bind the name that was used for the class to the instance that we created. So now when the program refers to empty iterators later on, it will just refer to this one instance, and we no longer have any name bound to the class. Now it's still possible to get the class and to create new instances. You'd have to write a quite a bit more code in order to make sure that that's not possible. But here's a simple way. If you want to define a class and then make sure that people only use one of it is uh, to define the instance with the same name as the class.